Next, we have um, an ecological economist to talk to us about our changing systems and the need to change our systems. So I'm just going to quickly introduce Mark Buckley, um, a new friend, a new relationship, um, and a visionary who is, works with the United Nations and the World Economic Forum. Please join me in welcoming Mark. We made it. 2020, we've uh, come a, a long way, and I commend each and every one of you that we've come this far because the things we've gone through, the things we're still going through in our world have not only shaken us to the core, they have woken us up to where we need to be. I just came from Stockholm plus 50 in Sweden. It's a 50 year anniversary of one of the very first climate conferences ever. And I just want to show you a little glimpse of the meaning of this important conference. In 1972, global leaders came together in Sweden for the first ever United Nations Conference on the Human Environment. It was unlike any previous event, bringing together 113 governments to discuss humanity's impact on the natural world. Now, 50 years after that Stockholm meeting, we face a triple planetary crisis of climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss. With this in mind, the UN General Assembly has decided to convene an international meeting entitled Stockholm Plus 50, a healthy planet for the prosperity of all, our responsibility, our opportunity. It will commemorate the 50 years since that 1972 watershed moment when the environment took center stage for the first time. There is only one Earth and the stakes have never been higher. Join us. You can't imagine it, but 1972, 50 years ago, was a pivotal moment in our world's history. Not only were we talking about the sustainable development and not quite the goals yet, but about sustainable development, we were talking about the plans, the roadmaps, the actions, the, the future things that we need to do to avoid what we're facing today. Now we've had this 50 year anniversary and what have we done? So we really need to ask ourselves some hard questions. Just on June 2nd, the new sustainable development report came out and uh, the progress is not all that hopeful, though we can do it. As we reach critical mass, we can really find some positive momentum but then we're hit with, with things like this, that there are carbon bombs set to trigger climate catastrophes. And we've heard from the previous speakers uh, on stage today that there are all sorts of doom and gloom like this, but it's not enough to change policy. It's not enough to change enough humanity to actually do something. I want you to realize, and I just want to touch upon the plans of the Sustainable Development Goals because it's not something that a lot of people understand the full impact of what the Sustainable Development Goals in the Paris Agreement are. This is how we were presented with the Sustainable Development Goals, laid out 1 to 17, very linear, linear and lateral, uh, uh, very colorful. If I ask people, do you know what the SDGs are? They're like, no, no. And if they do, they say, oh, I like number one red. It's my favorite color, no poverty. That's the one I'm working on. And I say, great, that is absolutely fabulous. But did you know that they're all tied together as a system? It's virtually impossible for you to work on one SDG and not touch on all the others. They are systemically tied together. And if we address them systemically and we approach them together and we add them into our business models and into our life models, it's a much better model for success. But I'm sorry, we presented them to you wrong because this is why I wrote the Sustainable Development Goal Manifesto. Sorry, it's cut off here. I'm not going to read it for you. But uh, I wanted to let you know that it's, I wrote it for the United Nations for the simple fact that we don't have a vision or a feeling what it would feel like to live in a world that reached all the Sustainable Development Goals by December 2030. 
And so I wrote the manifesto so that you could envision for yourself what it would feel like to stand in a world that had achieved all those goals and say, wow, that's a world I'd love to live in. Whereas if you are in the world today, a lot of us would say, well, it's not the world I want to live in today. And this is the true way that we need to look at the sustainable development goals, like a pyramid, a, a cake, a, a, a pie, where the biosphere's on the bottom. Life on land, life below water, uh, clean water and sanitation, and climate action. That's where we get all the resources from to produce anything that we do in this world. And without that biosphere, we can't do anything for society, our economy, and we definitely won't have any partnership for the goals. What most people don't know about the Sustainable Development Goals is that in order to achieve them, not only are there targets, indicators, actions, and goals, but there are six major transformations that we need to achieve in order to reach the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement. And so this is the six major transformations, if you haven't heard about them before, most people know about number six, which is a transformation for a digital re revolution, the digital transformation. That's one that businesses talk about a lot, but we haven't even really truly reached that. And so there's a lot of work, and those transformations are tied to all the SDGs. They're tied to the Paris Agreement, and they've been around since 19. 72 and before. They were actually started before Rio plus 20 uh, in Bogota, Colombia. Around the world, people are waking up. They know we need change, and not just at the edges. We need to change our systems, not just our straws. But the question remains, why does change happen? In the face of these mounting crises, it can feel hopeless, but it shouldn't. Because there is a blueprint for change, buried deep in nature. It's a story of transformation, encoded at the deepest level of being. The imaginal cell. A cell that contains within it a vision of something new, of something better. The caterpillar, while alive, consumes. But this cannot go on forever. Everything has an end. Everything has a tipping point. All that is left is decay. But from this place of darkness, something new can be born. At first, the caterpillar fights this new presence. What we want is more learning in schools and less activism. Seeing it as a threat, clinging to its old form. But the imaginal cells persist in spite of this. They begin to emit a common frequency. They cluster. They form collectives. Until eventually they reach a critical mass. They can no longer be opposed. In time, the old yields to the new, and something beautiful emerges. So know this. The future is not foreclosed. Alternative worlds are possible. A world where hope matters more than despair. A world where care matters more than profit. A world where solidarity matters more than self-interest. Change can happen. And change is coming. Are you in? This is the golden rule. Treat others and the planet as you wish to be treated. The reason I like this video from Reboot the Future, uh, a great foundation and organization, is because it talks about transformations. And I just mentioned to you we need six major transformations for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. That's not change, that's not projects, it's transformation. And let me tell you what the difference is. I can go on a diet, or I can grow a beard, but I can also break that diet by grabbing a box of cookies or eating a couple of burgers. I can also shave my beard. But a transformation is much different. When you open that door, it can never be shut. When you walk through that door, you can never go back. You can never put that butterfly back in the chrysalis. That's a transformation. And that's the transformation we need to move into 
for the future. And it's important to realize that the sustainable development goals aren't a business add-on to business as usual. Just you plug in one or two SDGs into your life or your model and uh, your organization. It is a true transformation. We did not leave the Stone Age because we ran out of stones. We left the Stone Age because there are much better ways of doing things. Just so you know, there's a set of monies behind the SDGs, and that is 90 trillion US dollars. This comes from the UN website by December 2030 that we have to reach. That's about 6 trillion US dollars every single year had we began in 2015. And here's just some other websites and people that talk about that, that it's an annual six trillion US dollars. But I wanna put that into perspective for you and then I'm gonna give you some big ray of hope. This left scenario is the high carbon scenario. It's 89 trillion US dollars, regardless by December 2030 that we will spend on a high carbon scenario. That means we wait until a building's dilapidated, we tear it down, we just build a new building as usual. But if we do the low carbon scenario, the sustainable development way, it's only about 94 trillion US dollars, which is only about 14 trillion dollars more. The reason that's important because the outcome is much more. Either way, that money is going to be spent. And I just came from COP26 in Glasgow. And on the first week, on Thursday, Mark Carney, Rishi Sunak, and, and the rest of the group in the Plan Aries pri uh, committed private monies, a $130 trillion vow to put cl climate at the heart of finance and to support the SDGs. So the money's there, we can do it. Um, but I also want to wrap up on the SDGs because it is an entirely new economic model. And most people don't understand that. But more important than that, it's the first time in human history 197 countries came together for the first time ever and agreed upon a roadmap, a plan of action to get humanity on the right side of history and save our planet from one point, and keep us at 1.5 degrees of warming. That's the first ever global moonshot. That's the first ever global earth shot. If you understand this is the first time in human history that ever humanity has come together and agreed upon anything. If you know anything about politics or delegates, it's the first time that they've ever agreed upon a roadmap, a plan of action for the future. And we have eight years left to do it. Um, we want to transition as humanity to the symbiocene. And Jean said it so nicely in her talk about partnerships. We were led to believe in many times uh, past that uh, Darwin's natural selection survival of the fittest is the way humanity works. It is absolutely not. The way our world works is a symbiotic earth, is symbiosis. And that means in collaboration and partnership and cooperation, not in competition and, and uh, survival of the fittest, only the natural the only the strong survive, not natural selection. And so that's really where we want to go, but I want you to ask yourself these three questions. What is your why? And if you've ever heard of Simon Sinek, uh, you'll know what a why is. And what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Not for your boss, not for your president, but for you. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? And the last one is, before this decade is out, I will do what? There are some new models in our world, and uh, there's a statement that came from Kara Wisher of the New York Times. The world's first trillionaire will be a green tech entrepreneur. I kind of tend to disagree a little bit, but I want to give you an example. This is the second catalog image of our Earth. It's called the blue marble, and that blue marble is, is wonderful. It changed all humanity. But there's two questions or two reasons why I show this to you, not to show you that we're on a world 
without nations and borders and divisions one of an, another, but this is our only home and you're part of this planet. You weren't dropped off here on spaceship Idaho or Germany or USA. You crawled out of the primordial soup of this earth. You're made of star stuff. The basic elements in your body are the same elements in this earth and so you're a steward and a part of this planet, a symbiotic planet. And the second reason is, how do we have this image? Had we not used the latest computing power, went to the moon, used the latest technology, computing power, and innovation, this image is sheer innovation. It gives us the heartbeat, the blood life of our planet every second of the day. It shows us everything we need to know of what's going on in our world. It is sheer innovation. And there are three pillars for life. And that is really, if you want to know or be sustainable and be around in the future, you have to know what economic models work and what don't work. Capitalism, extraction uh, economies, they don't work. But you know what does work? Donut economics, circular economy, planetary boundaries, shared economy, platform economies. And so that's really what I wanted to talk to you today about um, is different economic models and regenerative economies. And we're already out of time, so I'm going to ask you to please get with me and we'll talk about some of these many models. But the most important thing is to remember is in Biological, ecological, and life models, one plus one never equals two. And that is a model that we can use and the exponential function to solve our problems for the future. Thank you.